who is down in Temuka preaching, so our thoughts are with him as he preaches down in Temuka. I want to start by asking you all some questions. How many of you have started something but never finished it? How many of you have tried to go from point A to point B, but for some reason or another, you didn't quite make it to point B? Maybe it was trying to learn the guitar. You start with such enthusiasm and zeal, but after some time, your fingers get sore, and you don't make the improvements that you'd hoped for, so you give up. Or maybe you've once planned a holiday to your dream location, but for an some unexpected problem, cancelled flights, an illness, a pandemic. You didn't quite make it there. We are constantly starting things that we don't finish. We are constantly being disappointed when things get in the way or become too tough for us, us to finish the journey. And sometimes this mentality can weasel its way into our Christian faith. As Christians, we still struggle. As Christians, we still suffer. We still doubt. And when it gets all too much, sometimes we can question whether we will make it to the end, whether our trials and our struggles will pull us away from salvation itself. We can lack assurance and our faith in our faith in and in God's purposes. But my hope is that by the end of this sermon, you will know that God, by his sovereignty, is working all things for good and will carry us till the end. This is as sure and as fixed in place as every step in our salvation. That's where we are going this morning. So let us read our passage today. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans 8, where we will be reading from verse 28 to 30. And I know you might be thinking, I don't need to, Jordan, I've memorized it. Good for you, but I still want you to turn there. Romans 8, 28 to 30. Let's read this. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And we know that all things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would uh, speak through me clearly, Lord. I pray that people would be uh, convicted. They would be comforted by your word this morning. We praise you for your word and for the promises that help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the third main section of the book of Romans. In the first five chapters, Paul has taken us through two very fundamental topics. And what are they? The first is condemnation, the need for God's righteousness. Then we went into justification, the provision of God's righteousness through his Son. And since the beginning of chapter 6, Paul has started unraveling the very applicable doctrine of what? Sanctification, which is the demonstration of righteousness, of God's righteousness in our lives. It's the working out of our righteousness by putting to death our old nature. Now let's look at the immediate context of our passage. Chapter 8. Your Bible's already open there. Chapter 8 is a chapter of assurance. We've heard this a few times already in previous sermons. It starts with the promise that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and finishes with the promise that there is no separation from the love of God. Nothing can get in the way of our salvation. That's Paul's message. And in today's passage, we are provided a few more ropes of assurance to hold us fast through the storms of life. These three verses that we just finished reading are finishing off Paul's initial thoughts in verse 18. Look in your Bibles. Let's go back to verse 18 where he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
This is what we would call a, what you could call a glory sandwich. A glory sandwich. Verse 18, the bottom slice of bread, all present sufferings are nothing compared to the glory to come. Then there's the meat. Although we have been justified, we still suffer with the presence of sin. And in our weaknesses, we have the Holy Spirit to intercede for us when we don't have the words to pray. That was last week's sermon from Jason. And the final slice of bread, today's passage. All things work for good, for they are working towards our final glorification. This glory sandwich points believers towards a future hope and assurance in the midst of our current suffering and trials. That is the context and the overall thought Paul is painting for us. You might have noticed at first glance that our passage this morning has a lot of terms referring to God and not much to ourselves. Have you noticed that? In my version that I'm reading, the New King James Version, version it has ten references to God in only three verses. Have a look again. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. He foreknew, He predestined, image of His Son. He predestined, He, 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 He. The divine laugh. It's not hard to see that God's purposes and His sovereign will is the main driving force here. Okay? So this will be the theme today and helps us form the title of today's sermon God's sovereignty as our assurance for glorification. So today is broken into three main points, no surprises. Point one is the excellency of God's purposes for his people. And that's where we'll spend most of our time today. Point two, the destination of God's purposes for his people. And finally, the certainty of God's purposes for his people people. That's where we're going, if you're taking notes. We've got a lot to get through. Let's begin with our first point, the excellency of God's purposes for his people. Romans 8.28 is easily one of the top 10 most quoted and cherished verses in the Bible. It's a promise that has helped countless Christians get through difficult times and will continue to help Christians like you and I. It has been said that promises our food for the soul, food for our faith. They strengthen us and give us something to hold on to when our faith is wavering. During high school, I did a lot of adventure racing, and my favorite part by far was the rock climbing, rock climbing out on a, on a giant rock face outside. I was fearless. I never had an issue with heights. Sure, I slipped sometimes, but it didn't bother. It didn't bother me. Why? Simply because I trusted in the rope tied to my harness. You can't see I'm acting. It's tied to my harness. I didn't mind. I trusted in it. And promises like Romans 8.28 can very much act like a strong rope holding us. It gives us assurance when we need it most. So what I want you to do this morning is imagine that your Christian life is like, a, is like a rock climber climbing up a rock face. Apologies to those who are afraid of heights. A rock climber harnessed and tied to the ropes of God's promises, guiding you in the right direction, catching you when your foot slips, and giving you the assurance you need to confidently climb upwards. Are we picturing it? If you're not enjoying this, then please don't look down. Verse 28, and we know. He starts with the verse, with the word, and, which is a direct link to verses 26 and 27, which we heard about last week. What was it again? It was the reminder that we are not left alone after we've been justified. We can so easily get discouraged in the Christian walk. We put on the harness and take the first step up the wall only to slip and graze our knee and wonder how on earth am I going to get to the top? But praise God for giving us the Holy Spirit who fights for us in our weakness. And, Paul's saying, in the same way, God is also intimately involved with our preservation. 
He does not leave us alone to finish the climb. Paul says, and we know, we know. He gives us a confidence that we can know this promise to be true. He doesn't leave us doubting or wondering if it is true. And what do we know? That all things work together for good. What an excellent promise. Everything is somehow working together for good. If that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what would. Who's doing this working? Well, some of your Bible translations might read something like, God works all things together for good to those who love him. God is the one orchestrating all things for good and not the things in themselves. Goes without saying, right? Like I said earlier, God's sovereignty, working out his promises, is the main theme and basis for our assurance. Now, I do believe there is a little bit of groundwork to be done in order to fully take hold of this promise with joy. You today might not see the excellency of this promise purely because you are struggling to see how your situation can be worked out for good. This promise might feel less like uh, a rope holding you safely on a rock face and more like blisters under your fingertips. It might feel like just a Christian cliche that we use. You might be asking, Jordan, does Paul really mean all things? For my good, all things? You don't know what I'm going through. I can understand it mentally, but my heart struggles to embrace it. Let's be real. Let's be honest here. Some of us are really, really struggling. I don't know what each of you are going through. It might be the grief of losing someone. It might be being diagnosed with an unforgivable illness. It might be a toxic relationship that has been wearing you down for years. I can understand your reluctance. I struggle to embrace this promise sometimes as well. But let me tell you that Paul does, in fact, mean all things. The good and the bad. And before I explain further, I want to remind you that Paul is probably the most qualified to speak on suffering. In 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 25, we get a succinct description of his suffering. Verse 24, from the Jews, five times I I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And it goes on and on with the suffering he endured for Christ's sake. Okay, he understood suffering. And yet with all of that, he was still able to say that it was for his good. Incredible. Incredible. Can I suggest that the main reason why a lot of people can struggle to embrace this promise is how they define the word good. The definition of words can be confusing these days because they keep evolving. The word love is used for your spouse and a bar of chocolate, right? The word literally doesn't always mean literally. In a rugby game, someone's running through all the defenders and the commentator yells out, that man is literally on fire. No, he's not. Words are continually evolving, and the word good is no different. Our society that is only living for the here and now, our culture, would define the word good as anything that fulfills your dreams and desires, that is adding to your comfort and your pleasure. But it is so, so so important that we let God define the words he uses in the Bible. So what does Paul mean when he says, good, working for good? Good is anything that God purposes for his people. Whatever he chooses to do with us, good. And we are peeking ahead a little bit, but the good here is defined as our conformity to Christ. In all the situations we face, God uses them to make us more like Christ, which ultimately glorifies him. Amen? Now, I don't think I need to convince you about how good things work together, like God's grace, the help of the Holy Spirit. I don't need to convince you that those things are working for our good. 
But I will give just three ways of how God uses suffering for our good. Three ways. And yes, I do have sub points. Number one, firstly, suffering chastens us. It disciplines us. Those of you who are parents know that sometimes you need to discipline your children in order to address their disobedience. And when you do, they are thinking that you are bad. They're going, what is going on? But you know you need to do it because you what? You love them. God uses suffering in a similar way. Hebrews 12 talks about how our Heavenly Father disciplines us because, looking back a few sermons, we have been adopted. God actively disciplines us out of love. Hebrews 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chases, chastens, and, and sometimes chases, and scourges every son whom he receives. Jumping down to verse 11. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Suffering is painful, but it trains and disciplines us. Now, if you've been obedient, sorry, if you've been disobedient like Jonah and find yourself in a giant fish, then repent, obey, and praise God for his fatherly love. But what if you haven't been disobedient? What if you've been doing the right thing and you still find yourself in a trial? Well, that's the second way God uses suffering. He uses it to sanctify us. That's the second way. The Puritan Thomas Watson says that suffering is medicinal. Suffering is medicinal in the sense that it has a way of showing our flaws and weaknesses we didn't even know we had. All you parents know what I'm talking about probably when you first had your child. Lack of sleep. This child just keeps crying. Where does this sin come from? You don't know about leaks in your house until what? Sunshine? No. Until it rains. God uses suffering to sanctify our character. And what is Paul already written in Romans 5, 3 to 4? And not only that, he says, but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And similarly, we are probably familiar with James 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience, steadfastness, endurance, these two didn't enjoy the suffering itself. Paul wasn't getting stoned in Lystra in Acts 14 going, yeah, bring it on, the stones of joy. No. These evil things are not good in themselves. That would be wrong to say. No, Paul and James were able to find joy in trials because they knew that it produced in them a stronger faith, a purer character, and more Christ-likeness. Yeah. Suffering sanctifies us, just as you will never get pure gold without the heat of the furnace. And lastly, third, suffering prepares us for eternal glory. It prepares us for eternal glory. Look how Paul talks about suffering in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How is Paul, after all he faced, able to call it light affliction? Because of his eyes being fixed upward to the future glory. It's hard to believe sometimes, but the affliction we face is going to be so, so worth the glory that it is working in us. Suffering prepares and makes us long for eternity, amen? Long for the return of Christ, where there will be no more suffering, and no more tears. Think about athletes training for a race. They put themselves through 
gruesome training. How do they do that? They endure because they've got their eye on the prize, that medal, that first place. Their eyes are on the prize. How much more glorious is our prize? So, the Lord uses suffering for our good to chasten us, to sanctify us, and prepare us for eternal glory. These are just a few ways that God works for our good with suffering. We may not be able to see the reason. In fact, we often can't see the reason. But we have to believe in God's character and God's promises. I'm sure Joseph wouldn't have guessed what was around the corner after years of slavery and imprisonment. We don't normally see the reason straight away. Therefore, if you've become bitter with your circumstances, whatever it might be, is it possible that your definition of good is influenced by the world? Comfort. Pleasure. Is it possible you've lost sight of eternity? We need to submit to God's sovereign purposes and remember that He is intimately involved, not just standing back passively, letting it all happen. Job, he's a man who suffered, and he knew God was allowing his trials. In Job 1.21, he doesn't say, the Lord gave and the devil took away. No, he says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We need to adopt this mindset when we are facing suffering. If something is good for us, we'll have it. If something is not good for us, then not having it is good for us also. We must recognize that it is God's sovereign guidance that is the driving and directing force behind all the events of life. And this should be so comforting for us. By God's providence, he uses the worst of sins and the deepest of valleys to miraculously work good for and in his children. I mean, the cross of Christ is a perfect example. Like an expert doctor mixing and preparing multiple poisonous substances to finally produce one powerful cure. Only a loving and powerful God can do that. A quick side note, we must be very careful and wise with how we share this promise with people who are grieving, okay? Way too many Christians, they don't know what else to say. Someone's grieving, they've just lost someone. They are in the valley of the shadow of death, and people don't know what to say, and they pat them on the shoulder and go, oh, Romans 8, 28, all things are working for good. There's a purpose, my friend. Be very gracious, be very wise with how you share this verse. Don't be that guy. Don't be that person who's insensitive to someone because we need to rejoice with those who re rejoice and what? Weep with those who weep. That is true love. Just because it's truthful doesn't mean it's useful, right? My, brother, my dad, he would always tell me when I'm looking for something, I've, I've lost something, I'm frantically looking, and he would say, it's got to be somewhere, son. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. He was right, but it wasn't useful at that moment. This is an incredible promise, but please be wise with how you share it with people who are grieving. I'm finish my rant. So, we must conform our definition of good to match God's definition. We must be willing to submit to his excellent purposes, and then maybe we'll start to see this promise as the beautiful assurance that it is. Now, who are these promises for? Look in your Bibles. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purposes. These two qualifiers go hand in hand. The first is from man's perspective to those who love God, and the second is, from God's perspective, to the called. So what does it mean to those who love God? A love for God is the true mark of a believer. When we are regenerated and given new hearts and new minds, 
our general affections, although not perfect, are aimed at God and his will. You either love God or you don't love God. As John MacArthur puts it, in God's sight, there are only two categories of man, of humankind. Those who hate him and those who love him. Jesus was referring to that truth when he said, he who is not with me is against me. And this also implies that you shouldn't share this promise with non-Christians. If you're going to share scripture when someone is grieving or having a hard time, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, apply that also. But if you're going to share scripture with a non-Christian, share the gospel again, wisely. It is especially important to note that this phrase, those who love God, is referring to a title for true believers opposed to the quality of our loving God which goes up and down with our emotions, okay? Okay, Jordan, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's just meaning he's talking about Christians. Well, I feel like I need to clarify this because many people wrongly interpret this phrase to mean that the promise is only valid for people who are loving God enough. So they think, oh, if things aren't going very well, if they're not working for my good, I mustn't be loving God enough. I need to love God more, then things will start working out better. No, 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 no. That's so far from the truth. Think back to Job. He was an upright man when he endured the suffering. And that's why Paul follows up with the second qualifier, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God called us out of the darkness, and that is the only reason why we are saved and can even love him in the first place. Although the qualifiers are in this order, those who love God can only do so if they are called. Make sense? But what does it mean? What does it mean to be called? What is Paul talking about? A phone call? No, the Bible talks about two types of calling. One is an outward call, a general invitation, which Jesus refers to when he says, many are called, but few are chosen. But what Paul is referring to here is an inward call that theologians have referred to as an effectual calling, a divine calling which is irrevocable, meaning it can't be resisted. Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable. This calling is not like a, an invitation to a birthday party. Would you like to become son of God? Maybe. No, it's a divine summoning. Like that of a king to his subjects who will and must obey. That is what it's meant to be called. God's chosen people who are summoned to repent, believe, and then love him in obedience. So, concluding our first point, according to God's excellent purposes, he is working good in all things for those who are called. Suffering is tough, but it is not pointless. God is in control and working. Let's move on to our next point in our outline. Point two, the destination of God's purposes for his people. Let's read verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So Paul continues by linking and explaining the previous verse with the word for. We know that all things work together for good, for, or because God has predestined all of his children to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's our final destination and what our sanctification is working towards. The trajectory that all believers are on is being transformed to the conformity of Christ. Let's unpack this a little more. To be predestined simply means that God has predetermined something to happen, predetermined something to happen, and because he is sovereign, it most certainly will happen. 
To be conformed to the image of Christ could refer to a daily transformation, our sanctification, or our final transformation, our glorification. And Paul most likely has the second one in mind. And the reason being is that there's no mention of sanctification in the passage. Also, his reference to Jesus being the firstborn is talking about his resurrection. We follow after him, when? At the return of Christ in the last days. So Paul is talking about our final transformation into Christ's image. Think back to the glory sandwich. Paul is finishing in verse 18. He is encouraging us up the rock face and telling us to endure our current suffering and trials by looking up and forward to the glorious future that awaits us. The destination, our glorification. Let's remind ourselves of the definition of glorification. I did borrow it from Vanille's sermon two weeks ago, but I'm sure he won't mind because he probably borrowed it too. Glorification is the radical transformation of both the body and soul for believers into a state of perfect holiness, conformity to the image of Christ and the experience of eternal life in the presence of the triune God. Glorification is the redemption of our physical bodies. Hallelujah. The conformity to Christ and where our salvation package will be fully complete. It is the final step. Okay, when we were justified, the penalty of sin was conquered. Through sanctification, we experienced the victory over the power of sin, but we battle against the presence of sin still. At glorification, sin will be no more, and our eternity with the triune God will begin. The closest parallel to our verse is found in Philippians 3, verse 20 to 21, which says, But our citizenship is in heaven, talking about the final destination, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. He will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. It is mind-blowing to imagine that we will be transformed as close as to resembling Jesus as possible without taking on deity. Think about that for a second. A state of holiness and perfection with new glorified bodies. Man, God is so merciful, incredibly gracious. He, he doesn't just forgive us and pull us out of the gutter. He adopts us and transforms us into royalty. But how sure can we be that this will happen? Well, just as no one thought the four-minute mile was possible until it was broken, Jesus is the firstborn, the forerunner who demonstrated life after death at his resurrection. And we, by God's providence and preservation, will be the many brethren to follow in Jesus' footsteps. And if this is true, then all things must be working for our good. Brothers and sisters, have assurance that Jesus has already climbed the impossible rock face before us and that we will reach the same destination. At the beginning, I had you picture the Christian life as a rock climber climbing up a rock face. Our journey is not lead climbing. Lead climbing is when you have to hit the pins in, feed the rope through, and, and you have to make your way up by yourself. If you fall and you don't do a good job of the pins, it is game over. No, our climb is more like when you go to a children's rock climbing gym. Have you been to one before? You clip in and there's a machine at the top. It just pulls you up as you climb. That's what it's more like. Still take it seriously, but it's like a a children's rock climbing gym. God's sovereignty and his word is that anchor point pulling you towards the image of his son as you climb up. 
Jesus is the example we are to follow, and God will make us like him in our glorification. Yes, we have a part to play in our sanctification. Don't mishear me. But Paul's point is that as Christians, we are not dependent on ourselves to stay on the wall and stay connected to the promises. God has predestined it. Let's move on to our third and final point. The certainty of God's purposes for his people. As if there wasn't already enough certainty or confidence that we will persevere till the end, Paul smacks a home run with a chain of events. In verse 29, Paul actually starts a series of links before his thinking is interrupted with the glorious and amazing truth of our conformity to Christ. This series of links has become known as the golden chain of salvation. Let's read it again in our Bibles. Look down, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, who he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Who he justified, these he also glorified. Okay. This golden chain of salvation is perhaps the most succinct description of steps involved on the salvation continuum that you'll find in the Bible. The five links in the chain we just read are God foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. And if anyone's been tracking along with us in Romans, you can straight away spot that there are links missing in this golden chain. Paul, where's sanctification? We've been talking about it since chapter 6. Where's adoption? Where's regeneration? Paul has not forgotten these steps. They're not there because his intention was not to give an exhaustive summary and defense about the full doctrine of salvation. His intention was to give his readers even more assurance and confidence that God, who started a good work, will bring it to completion no matter what circumstances we face in between. We already have a pretty good understanding with most of these terms, but what does it mean that God foreknew his people? This term to foreknow someone refers to God's decision, his decision to enter into a covenant relationship. Okay, it marks his decision determined before the earth's foundation to set his love on somebody. Not for what they've done, not for who they are, but for his good pleasure. After that decision of him foreknowing, he predestines them, which refers more to fixing his or her salvation in place. Romans 11.2 is one verse of God foreknowing Israel which says, God has not cast away his people who he, what? Foreknew. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel was disobedient. They constantly complained, but this did not change God's love for his chosen nation because he foreknew them. And a quick side note. I must add that foreknow can also mean to know beforehand. Okay, the Bible uses it in that way. But there are many who use this meaning of the word here in this verse to support the idea that man chooses God and not the other way around. How so? They interpret this verse to mean that God, from eternity past, looked through to the future to see who would respond in faith to his gospel message without him intervening, and then... With that foreknowledge of who would accept him, he predestined to save them, and the rest is history. That's how they work this verse to uh, describe we choosing God. But look at the context of our passage. Look at the context and the doctrine of justification in Romans. God's sovereign purposes are driving everything. God is the subject, and we are the object. He is the almighty, powerful one, and we were the spiritual corpses 
who needed a new heart to choose God in the first place. Romans 9.10 is a perfect example of God choosing people completely independent of their actions. He says of Jacob and Esau, For the children, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who what? calls. Now, I don't have time to defend the doctrine of election. There's far more to talk about in that topic of God choosing us. But if you want to know more, we have a nine-part series on election if you have a spare nine hours. So let's resume our golden chain of salvation. After predestining someone, he calls them with an effectual calling, which we talked about. Once they are called, they most definitely respond in faith, repent, and are justified, which means God declaring them righteous through the great exchange on the cross. And finally, God glorifies his people. What has confused theologians is that Paul writes glorified, past tense. He continues to use this past tense when talking about something that is going to happen in the future. What's going on? I think that Paul is intentional about this to instruct the reader that according to God, who is outside of time, all of these stages are as good as done. There is no reason for you to think that although you might be justified, you don't feel like you will make it to the end. No, the issue has been settled. If you have been foreknown, then you most certainly will be glorified. It's as if it has already happened according to God's timeline. Look at how Paul stresses that no one falls outside of the succession of salvation. He says, Whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Why be so repetitive? using up so much ink. It's to stress that every individual that God chooses to love will, without a doubt, persevere. Going back to the adventure racing I used to do, during the week of competition, we almost every year had a, uh, an activity where you had to get as much water from bucket A to bucket B. And they would give us all sorts of strange object, objects, most of them having holes in them, so you can imagine, as a team, we're trying to get water, scooping it up, getting it to bucket B, and you can imagine it was very hard, and we would get one liter out of the first 10 liters. Now, God is not like that with his people. He's not dropping people along the way and scooping them out if they're not being obedient enough or progressing or performing well enough. No, we can know with certainty that through the ups and downs, he has justified us. If he has justified us, then he is working for our good and bringing us safely to be glorified. Now, why is this significant? If God chose you and set in motion your salvation, independent of your works, obedience, and progress, then it will stay that way. Yes, in Philippians, Paul also says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, to show evidence of your conversion, but don't rely on your works or the strength of your faith to keep you saved. Rely on God for your assurance. He started the process, not ourselves. These ropes tied to our harness are actually more like big, thick industrial chains which we can't take off. I might be stretching the analogy a bit, but... Let me share a story about my nephew before concluding. Recently, my brother told me that his son started a little ritual before um, going to bed to give himself assurance that daddy was going to come back and say goodnight like he said he would. Each night, my nephew started reciting daddy's steps. He'd say, daddy leave, daddy go bathroom, daddy have shower, daddy come back, daddy say goodnight. He would recite that a few times, and it'd make my brother say it perfectly before Daddy could go do those things and come back. 
And sure, sure enough, enough, Daddy would go, Daddy would, Daddy would come, come back, and say goodnight. If you're in a spiritual desert today or struggling with the assurance that you'll make it, you would do well to recite these steps of salvation, which God has already started as a reminder that He will finish it. He will finish it. So back to my question to summarize. Do you think about whether you will get from point A to point B? Have you asked, will I survive till the end? Well, Paul has done a pretty good job of giving us assurance that we will. Today we have seen that God is in control of all things and is working them together for our good. He doesn't talk about sanctification in this passage, but he aims to give us assurance during the journey of sanctification. And if you aren't a Christian this morning, you, you can't claim this promise over your life. Your definition of good is not to become more like Christ. You've sinned and continue to sin without remorse, keeping you at war with a holy God. I plead with you this morning to turn away from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ for the righteousness that you need to be forgiven. Don't wonder whether you're called. If you're convicted of your sin, cry out to God for forgiveness, and he will be faithful to show mercy. But as Christians, we are climbing this wall, harnessed, to God's promises to give us assurance through the trials we will continue to face. We've learned that even suffering is working for our good. Don't redefine good as temporary comforts and pleasure. The cuts and grazes, the icy wind blowing us around on that rock face are part of God's purposes to chasten us to sanctify us and point us to eternity, we need to submit to that. I know it's hard. I know it's hard sometimes. But reckon this promise to be true. Grab a hold of it. Recommit yourself. Like the psalmist who says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? And then end your lament with, But I will hope in God. Yet again. Remember that the promise isn't dependent on how much you love God. God loved us and sent His Son before any of us loved Him. And strive to love God and obey Him. But if you are called, then the promise is yours to hold on to forever. We've learned that God has predestined His people to be like His Son. When it all gets too difficult, focus on the future glory. Get your eye on the prize. Way too many Christians are too preoccupied with the temporary and physical and not enough on the eternal and spiritual. And we've been reminded that our salvation is ultimately secure in God's sovereignty. He chose you, loved you, saved you. So why wouldn't he bring you through to the end? Brothers and sisters, it's God's sovereignty that gives us assurance. Not our performance. The daily battle rages on against sin, but the victory has already been won. Amen. Be comforted today and have confidence that the climb you're in will get you to point B, to our glorification, no matter how much you doubt or stumble. And just like my nephew, with his father, we can rest assured knowing that our Abba Father will stick to his promise because of his good and sovereign will. Let me finish with a quote by Douglas Moon. But the promise to us is that there is nothing in this world that is not intended by God to assist us on our earthly pilgrimage, and to bring us safely and certainly 
to the glorious destination of that pilgrimage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your sovereignty, Lord. We thank you for your, your ability, Lord, to keep us on the climb, to keep us on the narrow path. Lord, we praise you for working all things for our good, for being the orchestrator who can use everything, Lord, to bring us safely to our glorification, Lord, to redeeming our bodies. We look forward to the day, Lord. We thank you that your son has come, died on the cross for our sins, lived the perfect life that we couldn't, and was resurrected, Father, to show us that we will follow in his footsteps. Lord, we, we pray that anyone here who is, who is weary, who is struggling to take a hold of this promise, that they would be comforted by your word, that you would give each and every one of us an assurance that it is dependent on your sovereignty, your love that you set upon us when you foreknew us. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's all rise and let's sing this closing.